Hi. Oh. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, I can take this off, right? Up here. Ah, okay. um, so, welcome back. Uh, yeah. um, let's see. It's a nice, friendly audience for, for a uh, welcome back party. That's, that's great. Um, I'm Stephen Yunser from the uh, UCLA English Department. Uh, we're co-sponsors of the, um, the series. Uh, along with cultural affairs at the university, and of course the uh, the Hammers public programs under the wise stewardship of Claudia Bester. Uh, <laughs> Claudia is the best, or no, it's the best. Uh, we're beginning the fifty fourth uh, year of the series which was originated uh, on campus at the Sunset Canyon Recreation Center. People used to jump into the pool uh, afterwards um, by Doris Curran. Uh, and it's now the oldest uh, continuous poetry series in Southern California, I'm pretty sure. I always tell these things. God, you people are great. If you're not uh, on the mailing list, uh, you can get on it, I think, near the, at the, near the entrance. We used to have it there. Um, and it's near the, near the books. No, the books are outside tonight. And they include uh, some books by Henri, uh, um, his most recent volume and, and a couple of others, very handsome volume, um, the most recent one called Blizzard. So if you know anything about Somerset Mom, I'm not going to ask for hands. Um, a few days, a few decades ago, he was one of the most famous English novelists and uh, playwrights um, alive. Uh, fashions change. But if you know anything about him, it, it might be his notorious assertion that to, to write simply is as difficult as to be good. That's a simple maxim, uh, indeed, if a bit dark, um, worthy maybe of being posted above somebody's desk. Um, I doubt that Henri uh, has it posted above his desk, but I suspect um, that he might want to agree. His way of writing is rooted partly in tradition, um, suitably known as the plain style. It's traceable in English to the 17th century. Uh, it values clarity, brevity, directness, in contradistinction to the more extravagant virtues of the, the Baroque. In practice, it goes along like the opening of Henri's poem on peeling potatoes. When I peel potatoes, I put my head down as if I am still following orders and being loyal to my commander. I feel a connection across time to others putting their heads down in fatigued thought. You can almost see him looking back at the long line of plain style uh, masters there. Uh, in fatigued thought, being difficult uh, being simple, I'm sorry, being simple is difficult. Uh, it's fitting that uh, at the moment he's hard at work on translating uh, La Fontaine, uh, the French uh, eminently straightforward uh, man of letters, and he's translating the fables, which are nothing if not plain style. If there were only two ways to, to use language, uh, one would be, famously, to consider it transparent, uh, like, a, like a window pane through which one sees the world. The, the other would be to consider it, the language, uh, the pane of glass, uh, the object of perception. So instead of looking through the glass at the world, you look at the language itself, 
where maybe you might see reflections, uh, ghosts of raindrops, um, a, a cobwebs, delicate cantilever, uh, fly specks, uh, maybe a fingerprint. Um, the plain style purist looks through the language. But most writers and many readers do, do not want to be purists. In one of his new poems, Henri conveniently alludes to, I'm quoting, a transparent glass made less invisible by a light that goes straight through it and then bends into a spectrum. That's, that's a mouthful. Um, one means of making the glass less invisible is by attending to the point of view or the, the tone of the poem. Henri's tones are, are subtle, uh, ingenuous, uh, disingenuous, uh, flat out humorous or deadpan, tongue in cheek uh, or sincere, or this is Proust's wonderful distinction, too honest to be sincere. They need a scalpel, you know, to make to make that distinction, and they change uh, these tones in the course of a poem, creating contexts that make it possible, uh, that make possible such unlikely lines, unlikely uh, so direct, so uh, plain as uh, "I'm glad I'm not dead," which is a, a sentence from one of all these poems, and. Even so much of life doesn't make sense. He creates these contexts in which you can actually say these lines, you know, and they, and they, they are memorable lines. If this were an essay, uh, instead of a preface that is rapidly uh, developing obscene aspirations, I'd like to call, I would go on to call your attention to particulars of such marvelous poems as Keep Me which I think you're going to hear, kayaking on the Charles, gay bingo at a Pasadena animal shelter, <laughs> and the superbly uh, rambunctious commencement poem, uh, Land of Never Ending Holes. Land of Never Ending Holes. But I'll leave you with one more quotation from tonight's contemporary master of the plain style from the, the opening of a poem called On Pride. I lived in a rooming house then and tried to be good. Ah, see, good, simple and good. I try, and, and, and tried to be good, but it was a real disappointment. I was a real disappointment, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll leave you to determine that tone. Henri Cole. One of the best things about Los Angeles is Steven Yenser. Uh, thank you for your friendship, especially your correspondence during these last couple of years. So I thought I would read <clears throat> I thought I would read from this book, Blizzard, that came out uh, during the long confinement. And um, it's my first opportunity to read from it in the flesh. Um, I want to thank Claudia Bester, too. I'm not sure where she is, but she is the Bester. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me.
A lot of my poems are uh, free verse sonnets, I think of them as that, um, which is to say that they're not rhymed and they're not metered, but they have within them the sort of fractures and leaps and resolutions that the sonnet form encourages or enables. This first, first one is called Face of the Bee. I do have a lot of poems about bees. For me, they're sort of uh, a stand-in for the poet because they take something raw and turn it into gold, as the poet takes human experience and makes art. <clears throat> Face of the Bee. Staggering out of a black red peony where you have been hiding all morning from the frigid air, you regard me smearing jam on dark toast. Suddenly, I am waving my arms to make you go away. No one is truly the owner of his own instincts, but controlling them, this is civilization. I thank my mother and father for this. After they died, there were replacements whose force upon my life I cannot measure. With your fuzzy black face, do you see me? A cisgender male metabolizing life into language, like nectar sipped up and regurgitated into gold. I grew up in a military family. Um, my brother's a retired colonel, marine colonel, um, which was in part the source of this poem on peeling potatoes obliquely. <clears throat> on peeling potatoes. When I peel potatoes, I put my head down, as if I am still following orders and being loyal to my commander. I feel a connection across time to others putting their heads down in fatigued thought, as if this most natural act sig signified living the way I wanted to with the bad spots cut out and eluding my maker. Instead of cobwebs, tumult, and dragons, I experience an abundance of good things, like sunlight leaking through the tall pines in the backyard. I say to myself, this is certainly not a grunt's knowledge, perception of a potato as my soul but a sturdy, middle-aged, free man's. <clears throat> I have visited several times the grave of Robert Lowell up in, well, I guess a couple hours north of Boston. And I do think of him as a, as a liberator, I think, uh, both in terms of the sonnet form, free verse sonnets, the last books that he wrote were, well, they really kind of marked me, but also I think he's a liberator in terms of uh, post-Freudian American poetry, I guess you'd say. Um, so this poem is called At the Grave of Robert Lowell. It's meant as a poem of homage. On this 10th day of the year, I play Stravinsky and sip vodka from a paper cup, 
taking in the view. Tendrils twining, leaves rippling, guts absorbing nutrients, brains marked by experience. All of it is dust now. He, she, all of them lie under sod. Men and women no longer rivals in love. Bodies grow old and fester. History is like an impressionist painting, a variegated landscape of emotional colors. As night falls, owls, bats, and hedgehogs come out to hunt. I take joy in considering my generation. I rewrite to be read, though I feel shame acknowledging it. Scattered among imposing trees, the ancient and the modern intersect, spreading germs of pain and happiness. I curl up in my fleece and drink. I spend a lot of time on airplanes, sort of going east and west. And this this plane, this plane, this poem, is um, set on a runway in the west, awaiting takeoff. It's called departure. During the minutes when a truck sprays frost off the small plane's wings. Two deer graze beyond the tarmac barrier, their limbs flexible, their rib cages pumping air. The buck's head is adorned with a forest that renews itself each year. We came down from the mountain for a ramble, the doe announces, wearing an ice frock sniffing his coarse hair, the bottoms of their hooves, listening to the frozen landscape. She seems to be only partially certain he cares for her as she cares for him. Turning their elegance toward the runway, they face me as I face them. Then the plane taxis onward and the and mounts gray, bulbous clouds in a slow dissolve. Opening a newspaper, I can feel the altitude against my face, but something deeper. What was that back there? Time is short. If tenderness approaches, run to it. So I have this French name because my mother was born in Marseille. And um, this is a poem really about her parents who were refugees from the Armenian genocide. Um, so this poem is called Weeping Cherry in it, though it describes, though it describes a scene, you know, more than a hundred years old, it is a scene that we see daily on the news, it seems. Uh, weeping Cherry. On a plateau with little volcanic mountains, a muddy river dangerous when the snow melts, a fertile valley, cattle breeders, and a music academy, a tall, handsome, agile people with straight black hair and an enterprising spirit, lived peaceably. Though there had never been hatred between the races, after a quarrel over local matters, massacres came. Men, women, and children robbed and deported. An evacuation, they called it, 
heads impaled on branches, mounds of corpses like grim flowers knotted together. A passing ship transported a few to a distant port where mother was born, though now she too has vanished into the universe and the cold browns the weeping cherry, vivid red mixed with blue. So this is this poem, Keep Me, which Stephen kindly mentioned. Uh, some of the poems in this book I look back to the 1980s when I was a, a student and then a young arts administrator in New York City um, from about 1980 to early 90s, a time that coincided with another pandemic. And so some of the poems look back to that time. Um, as this one does. I found a necktie on the street, a handmade silk tie from an Italian designer. Keep me, it pleaded from the trash. There's probably a story it could tell me of calamity days long ago. Then yesterday, tying a Windsor knot around my neck, I heard voices. Why have you got that old tie on? Suddenly, Mason, Roy, Jimmy, and Miguel were pulling at my arms like it was the 80s again, a darksome decade with another hard right president. My lips were not yet content with stillness. We were on our way home from a nightclub. I adore you, Miguel moaned, but have to return now. Remember death ends a life, not a relationship. I thought all that would take 30 minutes, and it took 12 minutes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the, um, so this is the poem Blizzard that the poem, the book takes the title from. When I was thinking of the title Blizzard, I wasn't thinking of a a weather event. In fact, I was thinking more of kind of blizzard of feeling. Um, as soon as I am doing nothing, I am not able to do anything, existing quietly behind lock and key, like a cobweb's mesh. It's 4 a.m. The voices of birds do not multiply into a force. The sun does not engross from the east. A fly roams the fingers of my right hand like worms. Somewhere in an empty room, a phone rings. On the street, a bare tree shadows a brownstone. Be precise about objects but reticent about feelings, the master urged. I need everything within to be livelier. Infatuation, sadism, lust. I remember them, but memory of feeling is not feeling. A parasite is not the meat it lived on. <clears throat> St 
Stephen mentioned this poem too called On Pride. It's really a rewriting, a gross imitation rewriting of a Polinaire poem. It started out as a translation and then Henri took over. <laughs> so I apologize. On Pride. I lived in a rooming house then and tried to be good, but was a real disappointment. A man without cunning is like an empty matchbox. I can't remember now the sad, slow procession of words between us, only the hurt. Plug the hole if the patient is bleeding, I thought. If you do the right thing in the first three minutes, you'll survive. So we put ice cubes on our napes. My pride was like a giant oblong pumpkin. My words were farting on stone. Then I kissed you until your face became red. I can't remember now where the words flew off to, but what an awful hurt. So maybe I'll try one of my fables. I hadn't thought of that connection, the plain style connection, but you're right. The, the vocabulary of La Fontaine is so simple and pure. He thought of his, his fables. He's, I love the word fabulist. I would like to be a fabulist. Um, um, he thought of his fables as having bodies and souls. So the narration is the body and the, the final aphorism is the soul. So I'll just read this one, I think, called The Deer Seeing Himself in the Water. Um, I'm, I should say that this is not my translation. I'm working with a 96-year-old Parisian friend. And um, well, when we started, she was about 92. Um, but I was with her just like last week. Um, but we didn't see one another through the long confinement, but we've seen each other quite a bit in the last year. But I couldn't do it without her. I'm not bilingual. Um, but I'm willing to look up every word and put it all together and work hard and make it sound good in English. Um, but she helps me. We're trying to do the what we think is the first free verse translation. Um, so we're not after, uh, you know, the sort of pounce, the pounce of the dance of the language, but we're after the, I don't know, the kind of gentle, erudite, melancholic knowledge that the poems contain. Um, the deer seeing himself in the water in the clear water of a spring, a deer gazing at himself one day praised the beauty of his antlers and could hardly bear the sight of his slender legs, whose shape he saw vanish in the waters. What a disproportion between my feet and my head, he said, grieving when seeing their shadow. My forehead reaches the top of the highest bushes. My feet are unworthy of me. While he is speaking like this, a bloodhound makes him run away. He tries to save himself. Into the forest he bolts, his antlers a vulnerable ornament, impeding him at every moment hinder the use of his feet, which his days depend upon. He then relents and curses the gifts which the heavens make him every year. 
We value the beautiful. We despise the useful. And beauty often destroys us. This deer blames his feet that ren render him agile. He esteems the antlers that do him harm. And I think here in the middle, I'll tuck in a few, a handful of new poems, and then I'll come back to the book to finish up. <clears throat> this is a poem called Guns. A lot of these are still following in this free verse sonnet form. This poem uses the word minatory, by which I just meant threatening. Um, guns stick in the... M I'm just realizing, I've, I've never given a reading where I used the word fart two times. <laughs> I can't believe I've got that word in this poem. That's embarrassing. I should have caught that. Um, stick in the mud, old fart. What are you doing to get the guns off the street? I'm not here to pick on anyone, but now that they have shot Yossi, who ground my meat in Hingham, and his shiny pink meat truck is for sale, I feel desolate. A gun is a vengeful machine exacting a price. A gun rejects stillness. It wants to get off. A man can be vain, almost like a god, but inside him is a carp biting the muck of a lake. A man who speaks too softly gets hit with a big stick and lopes along behind. A gun is minatory. Still, a week of kindness is greater. Run, hide, evacuate. Don't fire, duck, take cover. At Yossi's ceremony, his family put a gold cloth on his face. Self-reliant, autonomous, tough. He lay in a shroud of silk. <clears throat> I'm in just starting to enjoy myself. I'm just so glad to be doing this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. It's been a long time. Mouse in the grocery. There are no bacon strips this morning, so a mouse ponders a pound of sugar. A mouse wants what a mouse wants, salt-cured pork instead of soluble carbs. A mouse is like a heart. It sleeps in winter. It knows uncertain love. It appears to have no gender. Now this mouse regards a woman sprinkling water on lettuce as a man pushes a broom up the aisle. None of us knows what to expect out there. Surely pain is to be a part of it and the unwelcome intrusion of the past. Like violent weather that makes a grim chiaroscuro of the air before a curtain of rainwater falls. I clutch my basket and push on. Maybe I'll read one more new poem and then finish up with the book. I turned 65 uh, this year, so I, of course I put a, wrote a poem called At 65. Um, 
which I've never read. Why not? It was all so different than he expected. For years he'd been agnostic. Now he meditated. For years he'd dreamed of being an artist living abroad. Now he reread Baudelaire, Emerson, Bishop. He'd never considered marriage. Still, a force through green did fuse. Yes, he wore his pants looser. No, he didn't do crosswords in bed. No, he didn't file for Social Security. Yes, he danced alone in the bathroom mirror, since younger men expected generosity. Long ago, his thesis had been described as promising with psychological heat and the consuming will of nature. Now he thought, this then is all? On the rooftop, in pale, flickering moonlight, he pondered the annihilated earth. At the pond, half a mile across, was not too far to swim, because he seemed to be going towards something. Yes, the love impulse had frequently revealed itself in terms of conflict, but this was an old sound, an austere element. Yes, he'd been no angel, and so what? Yes, tiny moths emerged from the hall closet. Yes, the odor of kombucha made him sick. Yes, he lay for hours pondering the treetops, the matriarchal clouds, the moon, though his spleen collected melancholy trophies. His imagination was not impeded. Oh, I think I'll read two more. Um, I think I'll read this gay bingo poem <laughs> since I'm here. I've never read it here. <clears throat> gay bingo, the Pasadena Animal Shelter. My bingo cards are empty because I'm not paying attention. I can't hear the numbers because something inward is being given substance. Then my mother and father appear in the bingo hall and seem sad and solitary. They are shades now with pale skin and have no shame showing their genitals. This is before I am born and before a little strip of DNA mutated in the 30s and 40s, part chimpanzee overran the community and before the friends of my youth are victims of discrimination. I resemble my mother and father, but if you look closer, you will see that I am different. I am Henri. Don't pay no mind to the haters mother and father are repeating. And I listen poignantly, not hearing the bingo numbers called. I think maybe my real subject is writing as an act of revenge against the past. The beach was so white. Oh, how the sun burned. He loved me as I loved him, but we did what others told us and kept this hidden. Now I make my own decisions. I don't speak so softly. 
Tonight, we're raising money for the shelter animals. The person I call myself, elegant, libidinous, austere, is older than many buildings here, where time moves too swiftly, taking the measure of my body like hot sand or a hand leaving its mark. And the bright sunlight blurs the days into one another. Still, the sleeping heart awakens, and pricked and fed, it grows plump again. So I think I'll end with this, this poem that's a little longer. It's kind of an, it was written as an assignment. The, the president of my little college in Hiram in, in, in Claremont <clears throat> asked me to write a poem for commencement. So I wasn't sure what to do. But it turned out to be my real California poem. Um, this title, um, Land of Never Ending Holes, I actually borrowed it from an artist named Ken Price. Um, I don't know if you know him. He's, I guess you'd call him a sculptor. He does little ceramic pieces. But he has many beautiful, uh, well, he calls them drawings, but they're really little paintings. And they're of the, the Southwest, which I guess he thought of as a land of never ending holes. So the poem is Land of Never-Ending Holes. And the poem is really addressed to the young, the young people moving on to the next stage of their, their lives. I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to leave this place I so love, where underbrush jackrabbits in the desert press in on us waiting under a date palm with a suitcase and a cell phone, listening for the train whistle. This is how I picture you. Don't strut or you will stumble. Make your mess into a message. Make your roof tight and your clothing sufficient, and you shall never be wanting if you value the best property of all. Friends, Emerson. Remember the Zen axiom, nothing lasts, nothing is finished, and nothing is per perfect. Out there is a land of never-ending holes, where brown is the new green. Out there are omnivorous, dazzling human voices, coarse cries, airy falsettos, heady blues, soul and solemn low rumbles, speaking and teaching. It is never useless to say something or teach someone. The obscure human soul, it is sad and happy at once. Men sweep and stir up the dust, but women sprinkle water and settle it sweetening the air. Out there it is a swarming, venal, frivolous, vexing, crude, and hypocritical. But you must never cease to listen, look, and feel. If you love a zebra, do not settle for a taper. Think of all you have so far as a shelter made of tarp and rope and build something marvelous. Uplift, transformation, radiance. When you turn the old horse toward them, he will always pick up his step. See those bulbous clouds forming over the small San Gabriel Mountains. They are greater than any tanks or armored vehicles. See out there beyond the ash, avocado, lemon, and pepper trees 
A little trail ends at a highway leading to spin rooms and war rooms. But also there are bee spawn, motion dazzle, and maple syrup. I don't want you to leave. Out there in the land of never-ending holes, may those who love you, love you, as in the proverb. But may God turn the hearts of those who cannot love you. And if he cannot turn their hearts, May he turn their ankles so you will know them by their limping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.